right, everyone. So today we'll move on to part two, media and processes. Um, so art is a form of visual communication, as we have discussed, and artists generally seek to express something through their art. Um, and to do so, they carefully consider the materials and processes that they will use um, beforehand. So a medium, or plural of that is media, um, is the material on or from which an artist chooses to make a work of art. So that might be paint, canvas, marble, um, video, etc. Um, art can be made from just about everything, but there are some media and processes that have been commonly used by artists for thousands of years, whereas others have developed more recently. Um, so in this uh, week we're going to dive into some of these various medium and processes. Um, we are going to look at drawing, painting, printmaking, sculpture, um, craft, architecture, photography, and some alternative media and processes. Now we are going to go through part two in the Gateways book, but we are not going to discuss part 2.7 visual communication or part 2.9 film and digital art. Um, we're not going to discuss those two specifically, um, and you won't have quizzes over those two sections. So, And we'll start with section 2.1, drawing. Um, so the process of drawing consists of the depiction of shapes and forms on a surface primarily by means of lines. Um, drawing is a fundamental artistic skill and really the basis of visual communication. Um, and drawing really is fundamental to expression as a whole. As children, we typically draw before we write and learn to explore um, and kind of literally learn to make our mark on the world as we develop fine motor skills through drawing um, and kind of find this primal outlet for the expression of creative energy and ideas. Artists can use drawing um, for a variety of reasons. They can use it to sort of think or plan out, maybe define their ideas or prepare for larger projects. Um, for example, here we're looking at Theodore Jericho's Raft of Medusa, which we've talked a little bit about before. Um, so on the right side of the screen, we have the um, final composition, the finished painting. And on the left, we have a couple of pen and ink um, drawings that the artist created in preparation for the final composition. So you can see on the top left um, kind of defining the layout of the composition, although it's uh, perhaps mirrored from the regular, or excuse me, from the final. Um, and then on the bottom left, here Jericho is paying more attention to sort of values. So yes, still um, using drawing primarily with line um, to define sort of the shapes and forms that will be in the composition, but then coming back in with a wash to define the different areas of value within the final composition as well. Here's another example. This is Jacques-Louis David's Death of Socrates from 1786 to 87. Um, and so here you can see how the artist used a preliminary or preparatory sketch um, to plan this larger project. And one more example, um, this is Eugene Delacroix's Death of Sardanopolis from 1827 to 28. Um, similar theme uh, to the previous slide with Socrates' death of or excuse me, with David's death of Socrates, um, but kind of going about the preparation drawings in a different way, um, maybe a bit more similar to Jericho here, kind of exploring values um, and uh, communicative or maybe gestural lines in the bottom left sketch, um, trying to capture maybe the energy and movements that he wanted in the final um, painting. And then on the top left, kind of defining the forms and figures a bit more. Artists can also use drawing to make notations of their observations and experiences, um, things that they've seen or remembered or imagined, maybe specific emotions or thoughts that they've had. Um, and then, of course, drawing can be the final finished work of art, um, as we see here with Picasso's portrait of Madame Patry. Um, a simple sort of pencil on paper portrait, <clears throat> excuse me. And so drawing is really quite accessible. You don't have to have tons of 
special equipment to do it. Um, you can use pretty simple materials, which we'll look at some of those shortly. Um, but it's also quite versatile. So Renaissance man Leonardo da Vinci used drawing to examine and explore the world and sort of express his ideas that were beyond words. He filled sketchbooks with ideas and illustrations based on careful observation and speculation. Um, he studied the work of other artists, as well as the observed effects of light and shadow on forms. Um, we call da Vinci a Renaissance man because yes, he was active during the Renaissance, but he was also um, kind of skilled in a variety of, of things. Yes, he was an artist, a painter, um, a sculptor, but he was also an inventor. In fact, he designed a machine for human flight, which was based on the mechanics of bird wings, um, as you can see here in a couple of these sketches. But really, his most revolutionary drawings depict human anatomy. Um, da Vinci had no medical training, but he did dissections to sort of acquire that knowledge and learn about the workings of the human body. Um, and he did this far in advance of any medical professionals of his day. Um, by the end of his life, he claimed to have cut up over 30 corpses um, for this investigation. And in the winter of 1510 to 1511, um, probably in collaboration with a young anatomy professor at the local university, um, he compiled a series of 18 mostly double-sided sheets with more than 240 individual drawings and over 13,000 words of notes. Da Vinci was the first to depict the human spine accurately, um, and then he used his studies to enhance his own portrayals of the exterior of the human body within his artworks. Um, he was also really one of the first to study um, the fetus in the womb, as you can see on the left side here. Um, now, the church had banned all acts that they considered to desecrate the body, which included dissection. However, Leonardo da Vinci got away with it, um, maybe simply because he was highly methodical um, with his dissecting practices as well as his drawing practices, um, or it's thought that potentially the church was looking to da Vinci's sketches for sort of evidence uh, about how the human soul resides within the body. Um, either way, he gets away with it. Um, and goes on to use these studies in his own art. And of course, these studies have been used and admired for, um, or excuse me, by artists for centuries and centuries to come, right? So artists can use a variety of materials in drawing. Um, and typically we divide these into two categories, dry media and wet media, which is exactly what it sounds like. Um, and we'll start with some dry media here. Um, and we'll start by looking at silver points or metal point. Um, so in the late 15th and early 16th centuries in Italy, metal point was very common. Um, and in this process, a gold, silver, or other type of metal um, was applied to the paper or wood, which had often been primed with the sort of thin coat of bone ash and gum water. And so when the metal touched that coating, it created a chemical reaction that left a mark on the paper where the point touched. So here we have Raphael's Head of the Virgin and Child from the early 16th century. And this is um, a drawing, a silver point drawing on a pink prepared paper. Um, so a silver or metal wire would have been set into this wooden holder to kind of make it easier to hold and control. Now silver is much harder than lead or graphite than the pencils that we know. Um, so it would make very fine kind of detailed drawings. The lines are pale and because silver tarnishes, the lines tend to darken over time. So your drawing will start quite pale, uh, but over time it will grow darker in value. Um, now these silver or metal point lines are quite delicate. They can't really be widened with increased pressure. Um, so in order to get thicker lines, an artist had to switch to a thicker piece of metal, a thicker point or wire. Here's another example of silver point, this one from a bit earlier, um, 1480, uh, thereabouts. Um, 
so right at the end of the 15th century. This is by the artist Filipino Lippi, um, and these are a couple of figure studies that he did, potentially for um, potentially for a painting of St. Sebastian that he was working on, though we're not quite sure. Um, but we have these two figure studies that he's done in metal points, probably silver point, um, on this, again, pale pink paper. Um, and if you notice, he's managed to create these dark areas, kind of building up areas of darker value through fine hatching and cross hatching marks. Um, and then he's gone back and painted in some highlights uh, with white. Um, the models that he used were probably apprentices in his workshop. That was pretty common. Um, but you can see he's experimenting or exploring, excuse me, sort of the way the body would appear with clothing and without clothing, how the clothing would react to um, the bends of the body, things like that. So everyone, for the most part, is familiar with what a pencil is. Um, we use them probably almost every day, if not every day, depending on what we do for a living and things like that. But it's also probably one of the most recognizable um, materials used by artists for drawing. Um, however, artist pencils, artist drawing pencils are slightly different than, say, a regular number two pencil you would get from Walmart to take a test with. Um, most artist pencils use graphite rather than lead. Um, so graphite is a crystal form of carbon that was discovered in the 16th century. It's quite wonderful to draw with, but it is rarely found in solid form. Um, more commonly, it's extracted from various ores. Um, near the end of the 18th century, a technique was discovered for binding powdered graphite with a fine clay um, in order to make a stick, and then they started to encase that stick in wood and thus created the pencil. Now, graphite is typically preferred by artists because a varying percentage of clay in the graphite compound means that you can have a range of hardness. So the hardest graphite pencil has a lot of clay in the mixture, whereas the softest has very little clay. Um, this allows the artist to get different levels of value quite easily. The softer the pencil, the darker the mark it creates, and the quicker the pencil loses its point. Um, so softer refers to, quite literally, um, the pencil itself. It is soft, and that means that it wears down quicker, right? Now, the harder pencils don't wear down as quickly, and create relatively light marks. So on the slide here, typically when you're working with artist pencils, the full range runs from 9H, which H for hard, um, you could sort of think of it. And on the opposite end of that, we have 9B. So B being the soft or darker side of the scale, H being the harder or lighter side of the scale. Um, and a number two pencil kind of falls right in the middle, which we call um, in drawing pencils either HB or sometimes F. But it's kind of your your standard or your your middle. Now, graphite is also a pretty forgiving um, media, as you are familiar with, I'm sure. Um, pencils are nice because we can erase and correct errors uh, multiple times, generally. Although, depending on the softness or hardness of your graphite, um, some marks are easier to erase than others. So here we have a pencil drawing. This is Ilka Guido's self-portrait from 1944. Um, Guido has used various pressure of pencil lines to sort of suggest texture and create emphasis within this portrait. Um, thick, dark lines sort of imply darkness or shadow, whereas thin, light lines imply lightness or highlights. Um, so the dark value of the eyes and the hair, uh, the artist has sort of pressed harder. Um, which creates a darker line and focuses the viewer's attention, creating contrast with the lighter areas of the skin, the hair, the clothing, etc. Colored pencils are 
very similar to graphite pencils, but their lead is made up of wax and pigment rather than graphite and clay. Um, and they're used in pretty much the same way as a graphite pencil, but the marks are typically harder to erase. Um, here we have an example of colored pencil in DJ Hall's Piece of Cake. Um, the artist here has really pushed that waxy color um, into the paper's fibers to create a very rich kind of vibrant image, um, which perhaps upon first glance might appear to be a photo, but then as you sort of focus in and look at some of the details, or perhaps you might pause and zoom in or um, head over to the Met's website and find this piece so that you can zoom in a little bit. Um, you can see sort of the texture of the um, colored pencil and of the paper beneath. Another important drawing material is charcoal. Um, and it's also one of the oldest drawing materials. So we have samples of charcoal dating back to 30,000 BCE. Um, charcoal is pretty soft in comparison to these metal-based materials and even the graphite or colored pencils that we were looking at. Um, it creates marks that typically smudge pretty easily. They have soft edged lines. Um, they can easily be sort of shaped and altered after they're on the paper. Um, and typically charcoal produces a pretty strong dark value. Charcoal is basically produced by burning wood or another organic material in a low oxygen environment. Um, and there are a couple different types. So we have vine charcoal, which is this right here. Um, and it is essentially vine branches that have been charred. Um, it's quite soft and creates soft marks uh, that are easily smudged or even erased. Um, we can also have compressed charcoal in which charcoal powder is sort of mixed with a binder to create a stick. Um, it's often more dense and creates darker lines um, and you can work in a more sort of linear fashion with it. Um, and of course that can be compressed into a pencil as well, um, which would work similarly to a drawing pencil made of graphite, right? Now charcoal can be sharpened with sandpaper or um, something similar to create kind of a finer point and get tighter lines, though that typically works better with these compressed charcoals rather than the vine charcoal, um, simply because they are more dense um, in kind of material than the vine charcoal. And using charcoal really requires a paper or a drawing surface with a bit more texture. Um, often we call this tooth, the tooth of the paper. Um, and so the texture of the paper, or rather the more textured the paper, the easier it will catch the charcoal kind of within its fibers. Um, artists can create sort of soft visual effects by rubbing fresh charcoal with their fingers or a tissue paper, maybe a cloth, or even a special tool called a tortillion, which is this here. It's sort of a tightly rolled paper cone, um, and it has a point on either end. Again, it can be sharpened and used to kind of smudge in finer lines, things like that. Or we can use erasers um, to remove charcoal from the paper and draw in more of a subtractive way. And finally, artists use what's called fixative. Um, they spray a fixative over the surface to preserve the charcoal drawing on the paper, kind of turns the dry medium into a, not quite a wet medium, but it makes it more adhesive. It sticks it to the paper a bit better. Um, most of the time, especially if you've ever taken a drawing class or if you ever will, um, you'll hear of workable fixative, which allows for the artist to um, go back in and make sort of alterations. It puts sort of a layer of fixative over the top of the drawing, but it can be sort of um, erased or scraped and you can continue to work. So if metal point or silver point is concerned with delineation, then charcoal or chalk and pastel, um, which are very similar, are concerned with more volumetric drawing. They're quite conducive to modeling.
Here's a self-portrait by the German artist Kathy Kollwitz. Um, here she's used charcoal to create sort of soft modeling of the face uh, using various values. And we have this sense of energy in the application of the charcoal, kind of um, here in the arm, and then directly connecting the action of the hand to the gaze of the eye there. Um, we have sort of these spontaneous kind of energetic marks and um, kind of creating this expressive um, contrast and more controlled hand and head than arm and body, right? Um, the artist here really showing the range of the medium and creating carefully rendered areas and raw dynamic effects um, through different sort of applications of the medium. Here's another great charcoal example in which the artist has tried to sort of control the inherent smudginess of the charcoal medium in order to give us this very sort of precise detail and a rather intimate view of the effects of aging in this portrait of this elderly peasant woman. But the artist is still allowing the sort of personality or the characteristics of the charcoal to shine through. Um, notice how it's sort of softened the background through these smudgy kind of irregular soft marks. But on the face, we have, you know, every little line and blemish very carefully kind of rendered. And then the artist has also been quite careful to preserve the highlights here, um, especially kind of in the eye and maybe across the cheek there. And then using that, again, that natural kind of soft characteristic of the charcoal to create this very strong kind of contrast between the highlights and the shadows and just this overall kind of darkened tone of the work. So as I mentioned a few slides ago, um, charcoal is essentially charred wood. Um, various techniques for making charcoal have been known since ancient times, and these various techniques produce um, sort of various types of charcoal. High quality artist charcoal is made from special vine or willow twigs, again heated in an airtight chamber, so a low oxygen environment, until you just have the basically sticks of carbon left over. Um, natural charcoal creates a very sort of soft scattered line that smudges easily and can be erased quite easily. Um, but for denser, more durable, or more detailed work, artists tend to use sticks of compressed charcoal or charcoal pencils that are made quite similarly to graphite pencils. Um, so I've included this particular artwork by the French artist Rosa Bonheur because not only does it uh, kind of exploit both qualities of charcoal within the composition, it also, the subject also kind of shows um, the creation of charcoal um, for use as well. Um, but in the composition to create the smoke that sort of rises between the two figures here, the artist put down a consistent layer of charcoal on a greenish colored paper. Um, probably by using a charcoal stick uh, sort of on its side to make a wider mark. Uh, she then removed much of that layer in some areas using a cloth to create a blurred effect and in other areas using a finer tool, maybe the corner of an eraser, um, to create more precise lines. Elsewhere in the drawing, Bonheur used charcoal like a pencil, creating contour lines, um, hatching to model the shapes, and implied texture on the figures, plants, and trees. Um, now, when we're talking about charcoal, I feel like this is a good place to also talk about fixative. Um, a fixative is a type of coating that can be applied to a drawing to preserve its appearance by making that dry medium adhere better to the surface of the paper. Um, so once the artist has applied a dry medium like charcoal and sort of manipulated it by smudging, marking, or erasing, they can then apply a fixative to set that image. Um, because artists usually need to make changes throughout the drawing process, um, most 
artists use what's called a workable fixative that can be uh, sort of removed by erasing the topmost surface or erasing the coating. Um, most commercial fixatives that are used by artists today are sold in aerosol cans or spray bottles, so you can get a really sort of easy, even application. But essentially, the artist would apply the fixative to prevent the charcoal from accidentally smudging um, or being removed where they don't want it to be. Here we have some stills from William Kentridge's charcoal film, um, the History of the Main Complaint, which he created in 1996. Um, this is a great work to help us sort of understand charcoal as a medium and why an artist chooses to use a certain medium for their message that they're trying to portray. Um, so Kentridge is a South African artist. He makes these short animated films using large scale charcoal or charcoal and pastel um, drawings. And so one drawing is used for multiple frames in the film. The drawing is successively altered through erasure, additions, and redrawing, and then photographed in 16 or 35 millimeter film at each stage. Um, these drawings deal with political issues of the day. Um, they sort of address the personal and social traumas that um, were the vestiges of the South African apartheid. Um, so, the apartheid was a legislated racial divide intended to keep the small white minority of South Africa in power and in control of the country's resources. Meanwhile, it marginalized a large black majority. Um, it categorized people by race, regulated where they could live, work, be. Um, it made interracial marriages illegal, all sorts of um, racism and racial segregation here. Um, but the apartheid finally fell in 1994. Now, Kentridge was, um, you know, he grew up experiencing the apartheid. His parents were quite politically involved. His father was a defense lawyer for Nelson Mandela. Um, so he, he experienced all this pretty firsthand. Then in 1996, after the fall of the apartheid, we have the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, here, the apartheid's crimes were first publicly admitted and the perpetrators were granted indemnity in hope of healing society and historical wounds um, in this new post-apartheid society. So in the film, The History of the Main Complaint, the character is one of the artist's alter egos named Soho Eckstein. Um, so Eckstein is a greedy South African mining tycoon. He wears a pinstriped suit and tie, and he lies comatose in a hospital ward where he suffers from the weight of his past acts and for those which he is implicated due to his race and class. Around him, we have MRIs and CAT scans that reveal his affliction as memories of violence committed against black South Africans float across the screens. Um, the film sort of plays out the relationship between individual and collective guilt when Soho regains consciousness only through acknowledging his own responsibilities. So I'll post um, a video version of at least part of this film on Blackboard for you to watch to kind of get the full experience. Um, here is a quote from the Tate Museum regarding this work. Remnants of successive stages remain on the paper and provide a metaphor for the layering of memory, which is one of Kentridge's principal themes. Kentridge repeated erasure and redrawing, which leaves marks but not complete transformation, together with the jerky movement of the animation, operate in parallel with his depiction of human processes, both physical and political, enacted on the landscape and in this film in particular on human bodies. Pastel is quite similar to charcoal. Um, it's essentially a chalk medium, kind of with a colored pigment and a non-greasy binder. Um, it requires, again, like charcoal, a paper with a rougher texture or tooth to sort of catch the chalk within its fibers. 
Um, Renaissance artists often used colored chalks for preparatory sketches. Um, for example, we're looking at some sketches by Michelangelo for the Sistine ceiling, um, in which he's used this red chalk and kind of soft hatching and cross hatching lines to build up values and give the figure a sense of depth. The French artist Edgar Degas is probably the most proficient and inventive user of pastel as a medium for drawing. Um, he used pastels kind of taking advantage of the softness of the material um, to blend his intermittent strokes of different colors and create this rich, complex surface. Here's another pastel by Edgar Degas. He's really um, captured sort of the effects of light and color as seen in nature. Um, Degas' use of the medium is quite interesting because he's incorporating finished work with very improvisational gestures, um, kind of, let me turn my laser pointer on here. You can sort of pick out um, singular marks made with color, different colored pastels, but then you can also pick out areas in which he's kind of blended them together, um, really kind of taking advantage of the qualities of the material. Um, Degas also used a now lost fixative formula um, to sort of be able to build up these different layers of pastel um, and allow him to maintain the sketchiness of the material and create a variety of contrasting textures within his compositions. Somewhat similarly to pastel, crayon is pigment combined with wax. Um, many artists use a special type of crayon called a Conte crayon, which is very heavily pigmented and is sometimes manufactured with graphite as well. Um, this particular Conte crayon drawing by the French artist Georges Seurat is called the plowing. Um, and here the artist has really used expressive marks to kind of build up value and create depth. Um, he's kind of designated the foreground by using darker values, and then he allows the lightness of the paper to be more dominant in the areas that he wants to sort of recede into the distance. Um, the silhouetted figures in the work look as if they're maybe the subjects of a very dim 19th century photograph, um, and Seurat, the artist here, really exploits that rich blackness that is available um, with that dark content a crayon to really add depth and dramatic contrast to this composition. Now we can also have wet media in drawing. Um, wet media is exactly what it sounds like. It's wet, um, it's some form of liquid, but it dries or hardens as the liquid evaporates. Um, typically wet media is applied with brushes or pens, but it can be applied with just about anything. Um, so ink is a favored wet medium for artists. Um, artists typically like it for its permanence, precision, and strong dark colors. Traditionally, artists used reed pens um, created from certain plants or maybe quill pens using the um, wing feathers of large birds, which you could sort of think of these as the modern, um, or excuse me, as the equivalent of the modern metal nib pen. Um, but with these, ink flow is sort of controlled with a slit that runs parallel to the shaft of the pen. And so pressure applied by the artist determines how much ink flows out of the shaft. Um, so in this way, ink can be used in a more linear fashion. Um, an artist can change the line quality by changing the width of the nib or point that they use, as well as the pressure of the line or the angle at which they hold the pen, um, etc. Here is a pen and ink drawing by the artist Rembrandt from 1648 to 50. This is Cottage Among the Trees. Um, Rembrandt made thousands of drawings in his lifetime. He was quite a prolific draftsman. Um, many of these served as preliminary drawings, but many more of them were simply for the pleasure of drawing itself. Um, so you can see here he's creating, <clears throat> excuse me, varied levels of detail by changing up um, perhaps how he was holding the pen or the pressure he's applying to the paper. 
Here's another example. This is Van Gogh's Sower with the Setting Sun from 1888. Um, this is done with a reed pen and brown ink, and this is a composition that is featured in a few oil paintings, so potentially this was a preliminary drawing, um, or potentially it was um, just drawing for the pleasure of drawing. Um, but Van Gogh has, again, changed the way in which he applies his pen strokes, kind of controlling the width um, to create this undulating, restless design. He, um, he uses these short lines to create a sense of energy within the work, um, and then also contrasts um, the width of the lines as well as the direction that they flow. So ink is much more fluid when applied with a brush. Um, East Asian cultures have long used brush and ink for both writing and drawing, um, commonly using the same brush um, for writing and drawing. Um, so Chinese calligraphy is considered a very high art, um, and ink drawings can kind of incorporate those same long, elegant lines. Um, here we have an example of some Chinese calligraphy. This is an artist, Huang Tingzhong. Um, he was a poet, calligrapher, and a Zen Buddhist. Um, he believed that calligraphy should be spontaneous and self-expressive, um, quote-unquote, a picture of the mind. So we have these very um, kind of flowing, organic lines created with brush and ink. Um, whereas here in Leong Kai's poet Li Bo, Walking and Chanting a Poem, um, we still have a very economical use of um, brush and ink. We have very few lines and marks um, to create the form, but they're also quite expressive. Um, but you can see perhaps some of the similarities between the kind of um, organic flowing nature of these lines um, and the calligraphy on the previous slide. Um, so traditionally, Asian artists use um, sticks of solid ink that they hold upright and grind onto a special ink stone with a bit of water, um, mixing it up until it reaches their desired consistency. Um, and when it does, they can sort of push it off into this shallow dip on the ink stone um, and then dip their brush into it and sort of adjust the shape of the brush head or the dilution of the brush by wiping it against the stone. Um, now this allows the artist to create uh, almost an infinite range of grays, which we call a wash, um, and that really allows control over the values and textures that appear within the work. And one more, this one by the artist Wu Jin. Um, from about 1350. This is a leaf from an album of bamboo drawings. Um, so here, Jin is illustrating sort of the central principle of Taoism, um, which is the idea of balanced opposites, right? We talked previously about this just a little bit um, when discussing Hokusai's Great Wave, um, that idea of yin and yang. Um, so here we have that shown um, kind of through a combination of very carefully controlled brush strokes, as well as a looser, kind of freer ink application. Um, so the artist has given us a few shapes that creates the arrangement of bamboo leaves, um, but also sort of echo the linear marks of the calligraphic characters to the left of the composition. Um, and you can also sort of see how the artist has changed the values um, by <clears throat> excuse me, by adding water to make a wash and kind of dilute um, the ink and therefore lighten the value.